And yay, I'm here, yay. Took that long, sorry about that. Okay, starting over. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the first Make live stream from 2018. My name is Tyler Weingartner, video producer here at Make Magazine, and uh, today I'm joined by... Pep Swadia, I'm the photo editor of Make. And if you're not familiar with any of this show or any of the streams that we did last year, Make Live is the show where we build projects live on the internet directly in front of you. Those pages come from, or those projects come from Make Magazine or from the internet uh, or anywhere we find cool projects that we think would be super fun to build right in front of you. Sometimes things go wrong, occasionally they go right, um, but mostly we have a whole lot of fun building stuff. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't be able to do this show without our friends at DigiKey. Um, they make this show possible. They supply all the electronics that we're going to be playing around with here today and throughout the year. Um, and uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with who DigiKey is, they are a distributor of electronic components uh, based here in the U.S. Um, they build or um, they sell everything from microcontrollers uh, all the way down to individual components like uh, you know both uh, surface mount and through hole components. They're an awesome partner to work with. They ship really fast, and uh, you can find anything you need to build your next electronics project uh, uh, right there with them. Um, but today, or this year with uh, Make Live, we're going to be doing something a little bit differently. Um, we're going to be building not quite as many projects um, as we did last year, uh, but we are still, but in addition to those, we're going to be doing what we call skill builders. You might have noticed that that's a little bit of a different title that we're using this time around. And what that means is, in the build-up to each project, we're going to spend a live stream talking about the component, the key component we're going to be working with, and kind of do a deep dive on how you can program it, how to work with it, just so we don't make the assumption that everybody knows how to work with this stuff, because maybe not everybody does. Um, and of course, today we're going to be talking about the Circuit Playground. Uh, this is the guy right here. In fact, let me get the my close-up camera here. And of course. As we're working with this stuff today, if you have any questions, pop them into the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. And uh, we've, d we've done a little bit of homework on this stuff, so we should do a pretty good job of that. Um, so anytime you have a question, just feel free to interrupt us, and we will do our best to address that. All right, let's take a look at this guy here. Um, so this is the Circuit Playground. Right now we're looking at the uh, Adafruit edition, or I'm sorry, not the Adafruit edition, the um, DigiKey edition. You can tell in the back. Um, and so what this is, is this is a Arduino-compatible microcontroller. And, you know, it has, it doesn't look like the normal sort where it has, you know, that the header pins and things like that. Um, but you can do anything on this that you could do on those, and you can do a whole lot more, and there's a ton of really cool stuff packed into this. And what I love about this board is that as much as I enjoy playing around with microcontrollers, and it is a lot of fun, it doesn't feel much like play, at least not as much as it should. Um, they're always you know, kind of difficult to experiment with. Um, the, the code, Uploading the code to the board is, it takes a long time and sometimes frustrating. Okay, no, it doesn't really take that long. But when you see how easy it is to work with this one, it will make that process seem like it takes forever. Um, I mean, this leg legitimately feels like you're playing with a circuit. And there's tons of components on here to work with various interactions and outputs. And that's why I love this thing so dang much. Uh, but anyhow, let's get back to it and talk about what's on board here. In fact, the first thing I want to do is uh, there are two different versions. Let's make sure I have, yeah, I do have the two different versions here. Um, there's the Circuit Playground Classic, and there's the Circuit Playground Express. And they have mostly the same components. There's a few differences, and let's get straight into them. Um, the, two big, the biggest difference here is that uh, is the CPU. Well, they, they look pretty similar. Here's the two CPUs right here. Um, the one on the left, the classic circuit playground, has the uh, AT Mega 32U4. Yes. Okay. I tried to. Hep has been doing a ton of research onto the <laughs> the CPUs on these boards lately, and um, I I only know that there's a little bit of a difference between the two, 
uh, in inputs and outputs. So the Classic had the original Atmega processor, which is a little less powerful than the Cortex M0 that is in the Circuit Playground Express, and that is a little more flexible that lets you have access to some of the other um, architectures that are available to it. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with why you can program the Express in a ton of different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at what's on board here. Um, I'm going to put the Express aside for now. Um, obviously, the, the two of the key components here, and I think one of the best ways to show it off is I actually have the, the Circuit Playground Mega Demo. I, I've, I don't know if I really need to make that voice, but I feel like I do. Um, <laughs> running on the circuit playground here and it kind of runs you through all the components on here um, obviously you have the um, let me brighten this back up yeah i'm not ready to talk about the leds just yet um, input is your um, standard uh, usb micro um, it has the uh, jst connector for um, a lipo battery so you can make your projects portable um, and of course it also has the charging circuit on board here uh, to let you um, you know, when it's plugged in USB, it's charging this battery. You can unplug it and take it on the go if you like. Um, and then you have a ring of NeoPixels around the outside. There's 10 of them in total. Um, you have all these connectors here, and these are, the, these are starting to show up in a lot more of these um, fun experiment boards, so similar to like the, um, the micro bit. I think there's a few others. And these are cool because they work as capacitive touch sensors. We'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Um, but you can also make, they also make it easier to work with um, these alligator clip, clip connectors. Or if you're in the UK, they might refer to them as croc clips. I don't know why that distinction exists. <laughs> and of course, I just, I mean, there's no voltage coming from here, but I just connected red to ground. So that's bad nomenclature on my part. <laughs> um, um, but what else is on board here? Anyhow, you have a ton of those, and you can also use those as input and outputs. Um, like digital inputs and outputs, and um, uh, even has, um, oh, I can't remember the name of this protocol that uses the SEL and SEA, that serial connection thing that we used in a lot of the projects last year. Um, you have two different uh, tactile switches, two different buttons here, button A and button B. Um, there is a light sensor here, uh, and that's cool because it isn't just a standard, like, um, Brightness. Light, light resisting diode or light resisting light dependent resistor, but it actually is able to detect color as well. Uh, has a ter temperature sensor, just a simple thermo resistor or thermistor. Uh, it has a, a little speaker on there, um, a slide switch, and what else? Um, a microphone as well. And there's an accelerometer. Um, there's probably a couple other things that I'm forgetting on here as well, but we can go through some of the demonstrations on here. Um, right now, it's just here is a uh, NeoPixel display. Um, it's kind of cycling through all the colors. Um, you can kind of cycle through to a couple of different color patterns. I'm not sure if you can really tell. So I can kind of cut my hands right here and get some of the reflective light off my hands here. Maybe you can see that a little bit better. And um, this next demo uh, demonstrates the use of the uh, the microphone sensor. It's working like a sound meter or something like that. You can change the sensitivity of it with the right button here. Um, this is kind of the best one to actually hear voices at, at this distance and things like that. So you can see it moving around as we're talking. Um, what's the next one? Oh, this is a really fun one. Um, I might need to disconnect my microphone so you can hear this. Here, well, let's use mine. Well, first we'll go, go into the first mode. So it just lights up whatever pixel is closest to the uh, touch or the capacitive touch sensor you're you're touching here and then you can go to the other mode where it works as like a little micro synth so you can cool create cool space jams and are we okay so if you don't have audio maybe Give, maybe give your audio a refresh or the uh, the web page a refresh. What else do we have here? Okay, this is a demonstration of the accelerometer and it shows, I'm going to turn this down so hopefully you can see the colors. Um, 
it turns a, a little bit more red as I go, as I turn it to, uh, the, to my, towards my left hand here. More blue as I turn it towards my right. And then uh, this button just changed the axis that it's reporting on. So now if I tilt it away, more blue, um, then more purple as I get over there. Um, this demo is, I believe this is, uh, yes, this is uh, showing on the output uh, on the right, red LEDs here, you're seeing the output of the light sensor. So when I cover it with my hand, of course we're in a bright studio, uh, so uh, pretty much the only way to get a response out of it is to cover it with my hand. <laughs> and um, I've been handling the board a lot, so change the sensitivity on the temperature sensor. Then maybe if I can, yeah, if I cover the uh, thermistor with my finger, I can get it to go up a little bit. And then uh, Got it maybe to go have it one. go back down. Um, there it goes. There we go. And now we're back to, back all the way around. So that's a quick demonstration of the, all the basic input and outputs on here. Now let's talk about the other differences between the Circuit Playground Express um, and the Circuit Playground Classic. Um, there's two more sensors on, well, they, they included a bigger speaker, so you can get a little bit more sound output from the, um, uh, from the board here. And you also get, probably pretty hard to see, but you see where it says TX and RX here. Um, those are actually infrared transmitters and receivers. Um, so you can do a little bit of wire communication here. Um, have challenged me to see if we could create a, a TV be gone um, with the um, uh, with this, and I think we can. Maybe we'll be able to get into that later. Um, but the other key difference between these two is how you can program them. Um, the Circuit Playground Express can only be programmed using the traditional Arduino IDE. The other way, the Circuit Playground Classic can only be programmed using uh, Arduino and Code.org. And the Express is the upgraded one that can be programmed using MicroPython, CircuitPython, not code.org, but Arduino and MakeCode. And MakeCode. Um, yes, um, correct. I mix those up. Um, and of course, they, and if you are curious which one is which, um, obviously, if you have a Circuit Player around Express, that's the newest one, um, it will say Express on the bottom here. Um, this. The, this DigiKey one we see here, um, it's newer, so it has the classic one. Of course, this also says DigiKey on them uh, because they're cool. <laughs> and the last one, or the other one, this is an older version of the Circuit Playground Classic. And you'll see here, um, it just denotes that it has the, the A2 Mega 32U4 uh, CPU. Uh, so that's how you know you have the classic one instead of the modern one. Um, so yeah, there's a couple different ways to program the classic, um, and I think that's the one we're going to be actively playing around with the most here today. Um, the uh, so you can use uh, Circuit Python or MicroPython. I think I think what I've been mostly using is MicroPython, uh, and that lets you program in uh, the Python programming language directly to the the board, and that's a lot of fun because you get to see your changes almost instantly. In fact, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a demo in a moment of that. Um, that's really fun because you can be editing your code, hit save, and then you see your changes reflected on the board pretty much immediately, and that's, that's kind of nuts. Um, and then the other is make code, uh, which we'll take a quick look at here, um, which is this really fun block-based programming language um, that lets you build code really easily. You get this um, demonstration here um, on the left-hand side um, that you can experiment with separately quickly, but otherwise you just download the code, um, move it over to your board, almost like it's a file on a drive that pops up, and then you're running the code on your board. And it's really fun a fun way to experiment with the electronics and try out different interactions. Um, so I think first, actually, uh, before we do too much with um, the circuit Python, let's, or, or this, and make code, 
I want to show off one of my favorite demos of the circuit playground here, and that is this, um, what do they call it? The accelerometer mouse. Uh, so this is turning using the accelerometer and the buttons on the circuit playground um, to use as a mouse on your computer. So let's just go ahead and upload that code. And this is like if you really want to get RSI, this is what you do. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't actually recommend using this as a mouse. But it's an amazing demo. Um, I think I need to tell it. I need to give it a restart here, so it is not showing up in my list of ports. Well, I did say sometimes things go wrong on this show, and that's exactly what's happening. Let me restart the Arduino IDE here, and uh, maybe we'll get... And of course, if you guys have any questions about the board or anything like that, uh, let us know and we're happy to answer them. Fix it, please, Jay asked, which board is at Mega32 equivalent to, i.e. used on? Um, so that's kind of a complicated question. A lot of Arduino boards are based on Atmel chipsets. So this board would be equivalent to a lot of other Arduino boards because there's two versions. You have one that is like more compatible with, I would say, the Arduino like Duo and that, or even lower, like the Arduino 101. And then you have one that is the more performance one that is based on the M0 chip. And those ones are the current Power Horse chips, chipset that is being uh, deployed in a lot of Arduino boards. Oh, and I already see my mouse cursor is moving around. And I think I want to I try and do a sort of picture-in-picture uh, -picture kind of thing here. So you can see the mouse and the board at the same time. Move it over to the right-hand side of the screen here. And uh, you can see my mouse cursor there over on the right. <laughs> Slowly hovering around. But I'm, you can see I'm using the tilt of the microcontroller board and if you wanted to click something you just use the buttons <laughs> while holding it very still <laughs> so this is like a fantastic party trick to show a board in real time how it works yeah okay so uh, you get of course you get the right click on the other button there and uh, but anyhow that's a pretty silly demo um, which I encourage everybody with one of these boards to play around with and then wish they hadn't because it's, it's not a good use. Uh, it's not a good mouse. Um, <laughs> anyhow, to uh, further answer that question, the only board that I've played with that had the uh, 32U4 chip on it was one of the, um, the Adafruit Feather Proto boards. And we use that in the, um, we use that in the camera slider, the uh, live, st the, um, motion control camera slider uh, project last year. Um, we didn't really, I mean, we, we could have easily used the, the Cortex uh, version, the M0, because uh, there's another version of that board, um, but that was the one we used. It's just a more powerful um, version of the classic uh, in, you know, 18 mega chip. Um, I'm probably gonna be wrong about this, but I almost wanna say that was in the, um, that might've been the, uh, the version using the the, uh, the Arduino Mega, maybe it used that, that CPU? Probably, yeah. Um, but anyhow, back to these boards, and let's check out uh, CircuitPython, because that, that stuff is super cool. All right, so we're going to disconnect um, this one here, this uh, Circuit Playground Classic. Move on, move on to the Express here. And so a lot of people in the chat are a little confused on what a microcontroller and a board is. So maybe we could just give a quick primer on that. Um, a, so microcontroller, we, 
this is where we generally just refer to something as an Arduino, but there's a lot more microcontrollers than Arduinos. Um, that's just kind of where a lot of the explosion of popularity of them got started. Uh, but basically, it is a programmable circuit that you can write code for and then de de determine how the um, various components you can attach to it, or in this, in the case of our hero today, uh, has components directly on the board can interact. Um, they almost always at least have, even the simplest of them have at least one LED on board. And you can use that to write your first program for them, which is generally the, the blink sketch. Um, but I like to think of microcontrollers as sort of, if you're familiar with the web app, if this, then that, which lets you um, create interactions based on triggers from the internet that cause things to happen on other parts of the internet. It's like that for the real world. Um, I can say when I push this button, um, these LEDs light up. Or I can say, you know, when the temperature reaches a cer th certain threshold, um, then uh, an alarm goes off. Um, you can create all kinds of physical interactions through microcontrollers and program all kinds of cool stuff. And it makes the possibility of creating your own electronics and your own electronics pro projects a lot more possible than it was um, when you basically just had to create your own circuits and schematics and uh, take years and years of electronic engineering background. I still don't understand electronics, uh, but I've been working with microcontrollers for years and uh, they're a lot of fun. And the reason you would turn to something like this instead of a Raspberry Pi is if you had kind of a simple thing that you wanted to do where you didn't need the full operation power of an operating system behind it. Microcontrollers are usually programmed in code called sketches with the Arduino IDE. That's the most popular way to access a lot of them because Arduino gained such huge popularity. But you can also program a lot of these in other languages, such as we were talking about MicroPython and CircuitPython. If you're familiar with the Python programming languages, these are a natural fit for you to get started with these boards. All right. I'm just taking a quick look at, okay, so um, I'm going to, all right, we're, go back to the board camera here. So this already has uh, CircuitPython running on it, but I want to show you how quick it is to set it up on it. So um, I hit reset on this twice. And um, I think you can see there, hopefully it's not too bright, that everything, all the uh, NeoPixels on, on there are lit up green. Um, and then if we go over to our computer screen, um, um, we just have this... Um, Sorry, Finder's being a little bit weird on me here. Um, there's just this file that you can download from Adafruit, and you just drag it, and then um, you see here this uh, folder down here called CP Play Boot. Um, this is basically just a file-based bootloader uh, for the Circuit Playground. And I am going to just drag and drop this down to the C, uh, uh, down to that drive, and then it should reboot and then come back up here as this circuit pie. Um, although I wish I hadn't done that because now I need to remember from scratch the blink sketch. I wonder if there's any um, examples here because uh, I'm not super good at... Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go to the internet and get the example code um, for the blink sketch because I can do that because I'm on the internet. Live Googling. Nothing makes better internet content. Bear with me here while I pull this stuff up. And I was mentioning that um, default blink sketch, and that's what we're going to run here. And let's go back to our...
Um, this is an editor that Adafruit recommends uh, called Moo, or maybe Mew. Um, and I'm just going to paste in this code here. And if you've ever seen a Blink sketch before, I think I'm going to try this. Um, uh, oh good. We do have the, uh, our picture in picture there. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. That's going to be a tiny LED we're lighting up. get a little bit closer up on the board. Um, but if you look over in the code here on the left, um, you and if you've ever seen a Blink sketch before, uh, this should immediately start looking pretty familiar to you. Um, but if you don't, let's walk through it. So we're importing a couple of libraries into Python. Um, libraries are basically uh, bits of code that have already been written um, to help you make your process of writing the tools you want to easier. Um, I like to think of a, the analogy I always like to think of is a workshop um, where you can build anything. Um, a library is just, well, you install the table saw library. So, so you don't have to build a table saw before you can uh, cut some wood. Um, so here we're importing the board library. Uh, I think this just kind of manages all the general interactions for microcontrollers like this one. Um, digital I.O., which means um, we're going to be able to write to, uh, in this case, we're not taking any input. Um, uh, we're just uh, doing output to the LED. And then the last one we're importing is the time library. Um, then we're doing a couple of setups here. We're saying um, the setting up the LED variable, uh, and we're assigning it to the um, digital output board uh, D13. D13 refers to the in general, with uh, programming a microcontroller, we refer to the output pins as pins. Those are referred to the actual physical components on the board. Similar to like this, uh, these little um, output pads here. Uh, those might be a, a digital pin. In this case, some of these are analog pins. That's why I have the little A2, A3 marker. Um, in this case, it's D13, which refers to this LED right up here. Um, and then we also define the direction of that digital interaction, when in this case it is output. Uh, and then we get to the code. Um, there's this while true, that just means uh, while it creates a, a loop structure, and true means that um, basically it's going to say loop forever. Um, usually with loops you have a condition, um, say like you want to count, you want something to run 10 times, you might say while a variable is lower than 10, and then you have it uh, add one to that variable until, they, until it reaches 10, then the loop ends and the program ends. <clears throat> then we say LED value equals true. That means we want the LED to light up. And here's where we see the time variable. And here we want it to light up for half a second. Um, and then we set the LED value to false. It's going to turn it off. And then um, do that for half a second. And then finally, uh, here's a commented section uh, that I'm just going to go ahead and delete. And if you want to, you can run a quick check on your code. That's where you would get, you know, check to make sure there's going to be, make sure there's not going to be any debugging errors. Um, but now we get to the fun part, which is we're going to save this code. Um, the Circuit Playground, I think all Circuit Python boards will immediately run anything um, the, with this file name that's on that circuit py uh, uh, folder, it's just code.py, and it's going to save to the circuit Python folder. We're going to hit save, and now we see here, you see that light blinking on and off. And so that is the basics of our blink sketch. Now, um, Let's try and see what happens when we change the values of here. So we're going to change this to the time that the LED is on for 2.1 second. Uh, we're going to save it. And immediately we see that result on the board. At least I hope you, you guys can see it. You can. It's the little red one that you can see blinking. Oh, there we go. this light way down. Now you can really easily see it. Um, and. You know, go ahead and set this to one. Now it should be a really quickly blinking light. 
And so that's what the experience of working with uh, a board with CircuitPython is like. And that is super exciting because you can just iterate an idea super quickly. And assuming your code runs well, that's uh, where the, uh, this uh, check interface uh, helps you out. Um, we can do cool stuff. I like doing cool stuff. <clears throat> um, but I want to get into my other favorite way of programming this board, uh, which is, I mentioned it earlier, the, um, uh, the block-based uh, code editor called, not the Adafruit board, I, although I love that place too, uh, <laughs> called MakeCode. Um, and so now if you're familiar with JavaScript, this is the programming environment for you because under the hood, this is all JavaScript. Right. Um, yeah, so you, anytime you can go back here, uh, you can hit the switch right at the, up at the top and you can change between blocks and JavaScript. So you're, you're still writing code with this. You're just making it really easy. Um, if you ever worked with any of the, well, if you're old enough to work with the, uh, the HTML editors that were popular <laughs> in the late 90s, I guess they were kind of still uh, popular now. I just haven't touched them in that long because who has time to program a web page? Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, you could easily switch between the sort of WYSIWYG editor and the uh, the actual code. Um, and of course, you can do that with you know, again carrying the analogy forward of uh, a web page editors. Even if you're using something like Squarespace, um, you can still get there and actually modify the code. But this is just a, a fun and easy way to play around with stuff. Um, and the great thing about the block style programming languages is they feel kind of gamified, so you can trick people into learning programming without them getting nervous about it. And of course, it's easy to dismiss stuff like this because like, and, and don't get me wrong, this is if you want to int introduce somebody really young or somebody intimidated by programming to it, um, this is a great way to do it. Um, but don't scoff at it even if you've played around with this stuff before because it's also just a really fun way um, to play around with code and just experiment with ideas. Um, so I mean, I when I first started playing around with this board, uh, I immediately got lost in this thing of like, let's see if I can make it do this. Um, so I think I'm going to start with my one of my favorites uh, demos, which is um, uh, using the microphone. We saw the, the demo earlier. Um, I'm trying to remember where the, so you get all these different interactions here. Um, oh, and I think it's the graph function. Um, so here, this is just going to graph the NeoPixels according to a value. Um, and here, we're going to then go to input, and we're going to find our sound level, and just drop that straight into the input here and then graph that up to 10. Um, and I'm not sure we can see the, um, the board light up over here. We can test out a couple of interactions. Um, but I think the next thing I want to do is show how you get this onto your board. So you guys can't see because the banner is on the lower third of the screen, but down in the bottom left corner, there's a little download button that's bright pink, and you click it, and this little thing comes up that tells you exactly how to get it onto your board. Yeah. Um, take that out of full screen so you can see it. Yeah, so there's just this download button you can get to any time you like, and then uh, from there you go to your downloads folder, Oh, and I need to do one other thing, because um, this, this board is still set up for CircuitPython. To, um, so it has that, uh, we see here it's still identified as CircuitPY. Um, but if you hit this reset button twice, quickly, um, it goes back to being all green lights. And then we... And that's how you know that it's ready for you to put code on it. Yep. For make code. And I'm going to go to my... Downloads folder, grab this file. There's my CP Play Boot volume again. And then I get the Macintosh sound that says, I'm ready for. <laughs> um, and I think I may have 
program this code a little bit wrong because we see it's already completely lit up. Um, either that or it's very, very loud in here. Um, so we can experiment with that. Um, so we, so let's say we need a multiplier here to reduce the sound level because maybe it's just being too reactive. Um, so we go into the math version and let's bring in a divider. Sometimes it's tricky to find where you need to put stuff so that it, the right part lights up. Uh, so now we have graphing our sound level and let's divide it by, let's say two. Maybe four. Let's try four. Um, actually, what I really want said here that it'll get adjusted automatically if I set it to zero. Uh, so let's try and download that code again. I need to hit reset just once this time to get it ready to accept code. And we have our new one. We download or dump that onto the drive here. And Okay, now we actually see the interactions. And if I talk loud, we see it adjusting and, and we see the, the lights coming up. And that's just one example of how quickly and easy it is to start um, building code with this. Um, Facebook stream didn't start. Um, that's interesting. Did we... Um, hmm. Sorry, we just got a note that, because uh, we, we simultaneously live stream this to both uh, YouTube and Facebook. And we get, just got a note that our uh, Facebook feed is not live right now. Um, I feel like we're actually kind of getting close to the end of this, but let me double check here to see. What is going on with that? Maybe at least get folks there to catch the very end of this. Interesting. Um, uh, I don't, it, somehow our Facebook stream just completely disappeared from Facebook. Um, I don't think that's a, uh, I don't think that's a problem I'm going to be able to solve live today. Um, apologies to everybody. Well, it's, it's silly to apologize to people on Facebook. Uh, that can't see it, uh, <laughs> but we will get this video uploaded to Facebook later uh, so people can at least check it out afterwards. And uh, if you get this far in that viewing, and I apologize you weren't able to see this live. Um, but anyways, um, so that is just one example of different inputs and outputs that we can uh, get going with this thing. Um, let's try another one. Uh, I remember this, this creates horrible noises. <laughs> Which, of course, is a way, is a thing I love. So, uh, music, let's... Let's switch back to the other camera, and I want you to show them exactly how you threw that sketch away, too. Yes. Uh, I don't know if there's an undo. Is there? There is. Is. Um, I use this over the holidays to teach my nephews how to program a little bit, and one of the things that I 
ran into was they constantly forgot how to throw things away. So this is a good practice of that skill. Yeah, so uh, we see up here in this corner, we have this uh, forever loop, this green forever loop. Um, that's just, if you remember back to our CircuitPython um, thing that had the, uh, the while true loop, that just means it's just gonna do this thing forever. Um, but uh, if you want to, we wanna get rid of this graph light level and just throw it away. Uh, so we can do that. Um, but the next thing I want to do is I want to, let's make something that makes a really horrible noise. And it will create a noise that will change in pitch and loudness uh, depending on the light level. <laughs> and we're in a, again, we're in a bright studio, so this is going to sound awful. <laughs> um, all right, ringtone. Playtone and ringtone. I don't know what these two different versions. Let's start with playtone. Um, I guess maybe it doesn't adjust volume. Oh, set volume. Okay, cool. This is going to be terrible. I can't wait. <laughs> um, and again, we go into... And as you're seeing these interactions and you have an idea of different interactions we can do, uh, let me know, and I will see what I can do to build this thing uh, while, we're, uh, while we're working with this. So again, we're going to go down into our uh, inputs, and we want to find our light level. Um, that's going to be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what, how it in interprets uh, light level to, uh, <laughs> to notes. We might need to add a multiplier in there or a divider to uh, adjust it to the right level. And we're also going to set the volume to um, our light level. And if we did two different inputs, you could almost see us creating some sort of like theremin, uh, which if you're not familiar with that instrument, it's an instrument with two different sort of wands that create a cr capacitive electromagnetic fields, and you wave your hands around them, and it creates uh, spooky noises. Um, and okay, so we're going to go ahead and give this a try. We're going to hit the download button again. Get this reminder uh, that comes up every time that tells us how to uh, get the code to our circuit playground. Yes, put it into get new code mode. There's probably a fancy name for that, I don't know. <laughs> oh, wow. And already it's making this sort of And I will put my microphone by it. It sort of sounds like old hard drives. It I does. think I think we could get a much cooler sound out of that uh, if we I'm gonna shut it up a little bit. Let's get some multipliers in there so you get it really screaming. <laughs> um, and let's see. Input is light level. Oh wait, no, we don't need that. We need some math. So it wasn't very loud, so let's get the light level in there. Um, unfortunately, I cleared that um, light level input. And let's multiply that by this is for our volume. That was a little bit loud, but let's let's raise that a little bit. And then we're gonna play, we're gonna pop this out, get our input again. Oops, no, that's not right. Math, get our multiplier again. Let's get this thing really screaming. <laughs> let's make that five. Can we blow the speaker out? <laughs> I think we'll just make ourselves upset. That's trying to make an awful racket. And let's, um, I 
apologies to anybody who heard that on the stream in headphones. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, we're not. <laughs> um, so anyways, what, what other... Um, get this picture and picture out of here and go back to us and... What other interactions would people like to see? Do you have any interactions you'd like to see with this thing? Well, we all know what I want. I want to try and do the TV Be Gone. But okay. I'm not sure that we can get it done because we don't have a TV to test it against. That is a good, bad problem to have. Um, oh, I know. I know what, what we can play around with. Let's show off some of the um, interactions we can have with external stuff using our... Uh, we have a handy servo motor here. Uh, let's take a look board by itself. Um, I mentioned you can obviously attach stuff to this using crop clips, which I am now going to call them. I probably should have adjusted this camera fully before I switched to it, but well, it's art. It's a little bit out of focus for a moment. Um, and so we have three different connections on a standard servo motor. Um, Obviously, they have to plug into your standard servo plug, which says it's this three-wire harness here. So you need a short bit of jumpers, or you need uh, alligator clips that have bare wires uh, on one side. Um, and then we have a ground. So you can attach that to this guy here. Uh, we need some voltage, so we attach that to 3V3. And the last one is we need an analog output, so connect it to A3. All right, so that's the connection to the board. And um, next thing I should do is I should attach something to that servo so it's a little bit easier to see when it's moving. I only planned this demo partially in advance, but we're going to use a little bit of shrink tubing and a little bit of gaff tape to stick on there just to make that movement easier to see. Because right now I have that round servo horn, oh, servo horn on there, it's not the easiest to see. Unless you can see the teeth, it's hard to know if it's spinning and they're so tiny. No, it's smooth. It's got a smooth one. Yeah, these are the sort of ones I think you might like use them for automata and just like put little wire hooks through there to have them move other robotic bits about. <laughs> Flail their robotic appendages. All right, there's that. Let's get this ground wire out of the way. And now we need to get back into our code. All right. Let's get rid of this horrible noise machine. Could and we make it trigger on noise, though? Could we make it wave? Because Stuff with Kirby in the chat had an idea. He says, I've just got a fun project idea. Like when at a sports event, they say, make some noise, attach a tiny flag to the servo, and have it rise to the sound, and then shake if the sound level is reached. So we could probably. So what, what we're talking about here is not, because the easy interaction here is, like we've been doing, map the servo position to the sound level. But it sounds like what, what Kirby is talking about here is a more advanced version that when the sound level is above a threshold, <clears throat> you want it to wave back and forth. Yes. Um, that's more, I, maybe I misinterpreted that wrong. I'm okay with that because that means that we, um, that means that uh, we get to build something a little bit more complicated uh, and we get to get into some more interesting stuff here. So I think the first thing we want to do is go into logic here. Um, and again, if, you're, if you've done any programming, this is like if something is true, in this case we want to say if the sound level is over a certain value, <clears throat> then do a thing. And here's where we do add, add in the blocks to do the thing that we want it to do. Um, and then I believe also in logic, we want to find uh, comparisons. Yes, this is what we want. If and we are looking for the input, which is sound level. 
And if sound level is greater than, this is, these are probably getting pretty small. It's a little pull down that you have all your comparisons of equals, doesn't equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. I, I believe I reversed those last two, but um, if it's greater than, and I don't know, this is the thing I don't know, and I'm sure there is a way uh, to actively map um, sound level. So I don't know what these are going to be. What increments? Yeah, what increments we're working with. I'm going to assume they're between zero and one, or in 255. So let's make that guess. I'm going to plug this in at 128, um, and we'll we'll have to experiment from there. And now we need, uh, well, now we need a loop because we want it to wave back and forth. Um, as long as it's louder than that. Um, so we need, actually no, we don't want, we don't want an if, um, but we want to keep the rest of this. We want a while and the same comparison. Or comparison. <clears throat> While it's louder than 128, then we want it to do our movements. And I believe the all that stuff is down in, I think it's in control. Where is this stuff? Under pins? No, wait, that was. Yes, it is in pins. Good call. Um, server write pin, and here we need to tell it the, um, the analog pin, A3. A, A um, and let's have it go between um, 90 and 120. So we're going to set it to 90. Let's go, actually, 90 and, um, let's go a good 90 degree turn. So 90 and 180, um, 45 and 135. And we need to put in a little bit of a delay. And then we need to write, I might actually, um, these are not your normal like delay milliseconds, but really, really short. I think these are microseconds. Yeah, that's got a little micro. Um, and then we need another pin for the server write. Again, we set it to A3. And now we're going to set this to 135. <clears throat> and we need to wait it have it wait again. We need to put in these weights because um, otherwise it'll immediately try to go to the next servo block. Um, and it won't have time to get to the position we, are, we asked it to go to in the first place. Um, Something to remember when you're making your robots later down the line. Yeah. All right. And so we have our code here. And um, let's go ahead and download this. Put it onto our board, and we can start to see if we have the right values in there. Yay! All right, so we can already see it's cheering. We can also see that our sound volume, our sound threshold is probably too low. Way too low. Um, so let's try and get to where we actually have to make some noise. Let's set it pretty high. Let's set it at 200. Again, I'm guessing that the threshold is above, uh, is from 0 to 255. But that at least gets us a good feedback on if our, um, that our servo motion is good. So, you know, it's not perfect, but every, every step we, we make another, we make good progress. So just got to hit reset to put it back into give me some code mode. Code intake. Okay, that is, threshold is still too low. So it's probably a big number. Let's try a thousand. I 
And as you can see, we're iterating this super fast. So unlike the days of past where you had to do many complicated steps to get your code onto your microcontroller, especially and, when you made mistakes. And again, a shout out for CircuitPython. Um, all right, it's definitely not responding to that. My, one of my favorite. Definitely not doing anything. Okay, that number's too high. If you ever want to test the sound output uh, of something, uh, just blow on a microphone. <laughs> um, so let's maybe 500? Yeah, I remember learning that one when, I can't remember which one of the Zelda DS games came out uh, that it wanted you to shout into your microphone. And I was often playing my DS on the bus here in San Francisco. <laughs> uh, and while shouting isn't the most uncommon thing to hear on San Francisco city buses, it wasn't an activity I wanted to partake in. So I just blew on my microphone, but that sounds like a nightmare in a microphone. Okay. Um, hello? All right, that's still a little too low. So maybe we're hitting the threshold. But like any good game of high-low. Split the difference. Just slowly get there. I'm going to try 300. Go a little bit lower. All right, that's not triggering it, but hello, hello. No. Nope. Still not. So maybe 255 is the top end, and it's just super loud in here next to that. Well, let's try 240. Or actually, the other thing we could be, tr well, sound level is greater than, no. We should be able to get the right. All right, and oh, got to reset it. Get back into the code mode. Yay, now it's working again. So it's probably just really loud in here. <laughs> <clears throat> Still, that is, I wonder if this is where we can get If we need a, if a little bit of math can help us out here, maybe if we divide the sound output or the sound input. And let's set this to, let's go set that back down to 200. I think here. So 200, it was triggering all the time. It's sound level two. Okay, let's give this a try. All right, here don't, we go. Don't think too much. When in doubt, just keep iterating. Nope. Okay, so it's not interacting yet. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Come on, give us a good. I don't know why this isn't working. This is frustrating. Um, all right, I'm going to. Try changing it to 100 and seeing if it still triggers. Because at that point, wouldn't it have been um, with the division by two, wouldn't it be equivalent to 200? And we can make sure that that was the right number it was supposed to be hitting. Um, yeah. So you said if it's greater than 100. And this is also where it'd be super useful to find out. What that means. Um, <laughs> what sound level what means. Our, what our outputs are here, too. Um, I wonder if there's any console. Um,
let's actually try this out. Let's try some... I've never done this before. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but here's this console mode, console log, and we're going to log the sound level. And that way we can tell, um, hopefully, if I'm, if I'm assuming this is right, uh, we're going to figure out uh, what these... All right, I wonder if that's looking for a variable. I wonder if I need to get into variables and say set item to sound level. And then log whatever that. Console log. Maybe I'm. Um, and do we want to try using the virtual version here to test? Show console simulator. I don't know what exactly what that means. Um, the oh, only wait, trick with the virtual version is I don't know where it's picking up. It's probably the regular microphone. Yeah, and that's not really going to help us out here. All right, how do I get, oh, is this a arrow here? Maybe this console log isn't what I want. Console log value x equals Benny is recommending to get our meter, but that wouldn't work because what we're trying to get is the software logic, what it's set, setting sound level as. So a voltmeter would not help us there because it's not a signal that we can pick up by touching pins. We need to figure out what the software on the board is reading sound level as. What the increments are, so to speak. All right, so maybe now, oh, that's the console simulator. We don't want a simulator. We want the actual console. Yeah, and do we have a console? Um, no. All right, so maybe this, <clears throat> all right, maybe, maybe I need to learn more before I, understand what I'm doing here. Um, so I'm going to move this aside. Go back to our thing here. This should be possible. Oh, I didn't reset it properly. Sometimes those tiny buttons, the tiny reset buttons, can be exceedingly hard to touch. <laughs> Okay. Yay! All right. So it's not iterating backwards, no. probably. It's just somehow the difference between 200 and 240. 220. Did, did 240 still? 240 did not trigger. Do we want to try 220? Oh, thank you. Just once. Yeah, we only need to do do it twice to get it out of circuit python. Oh right, to get out of circuit python. Alright. Did two did two forty still? I thought two forty let's try two fifty. Do we want to try two fifty? I thought two forty was still act, still activating. Well, thank you. Just once. Yeah, we only need to do do it twice to get it out of circuit pipe. Oh right, to get out of circuit pipe. That's still doing that, and let's just try two fifty five. So maybe it goes up to two fifty five as the top bound, like we thought, but it's just exceptionally loud. Nope. Still going. All right. We can protect it from hearing. No. 
Yeah, even though you can see the little... Well, instead of sound this time, let's change it to light. And then we can... Let's try one more time, and then we'll, we'll give that... All right. Um, yeah, let's try a different input here. So Benny suggested a light sensor, and this board does have a light sensor on it. And again, we're going to be starting over a little bit with trying to figure out what our, our correct values are. Now, I noticed when you added light level, this happened in the corner. I think that um, is a... Oh, that's a little slider you can say... Okay, so there we actually do get some so, understanding of like how bright it is. Yes, that's simulating the light that would be hitting the light sensor. So there we get... There we at least know... Do we get something like that with sound level? Nope. Nope. Oh, we Wait. did, down there. That little gray one. So we did find that the top upper bound is 255, but I think it's just too loud in here. It's picking it up, probably all the background noise, which... I wonder, but it's interesting that it would just max that out. I wonder if there's, it's, if we're better off, um, doing the comparison the other direction. Hmm. Um, sound level from there. Give that a try. And ignore my ch Chan had a very interesting suggestion to actually look at the JavaScript and see. Though I don't necessarily know that that would help us, it might give us the upper bound of the slider. All right. Well, it does work the other way. Okay. Well, that does show pretty much what we suspected. Yeah. It doesn't show actually an upper bound or... Let's try light level. And see what happens. <clears throat> and let's download that. I've got it set fairly high. Um, but I figure I can just shine my... All right, so it's not interacting yet, but I bet if I shine, shone my uh, camera light on it... Yay! So you get enough brightness on there, and you take it away, it stops waving. Okay. And so that is basically the very basics of robotics right there, <laughs> which um, is make a, sense, make a servo move. But I'm not willing to give up on this quite yet. Um, so we change this to sound level, and we know that 200 is... So that just means we need to do a multiplier here. Um, so we can cut the sound level down to something manageable. <clears throat> so let's get some math in here. Um, do sound level. Get it in that blob there. And let's multiply our sound level by 0 0.8. Let's go by 0.7.
All right, it's not doing anything yet, but if we yell at it, hello? Hello, hello, <laughs> hello. Okay, um, not quite, not quite, but this is, this is good because um, that allows us to figure out something that just kind of inch towards this, maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.85. Okay, that's too much, but we're getting closer. Split the difference at eight. Let's try eight, and then maybe inch down towards seven. Oops, didn't download the code yet. So you can see in our window that we have many files now, which is the traditional way to do Arduino sketches and <laughs> <laughs> work with a board. <clears throat> All right, so we see that uh, 0.8 is too, still too much. So that's to 0.77. But if we were working with MicroPython, we could just constantly be opening that file on the board itself and, and just, editing right there. And just every time you save, you get a different iteration. And if you, like me, make a lot of mistakes, and end up with a million different versions, it can be very helpful. Okay. Still too sensitive. Did we try 0.75? Or did we just, it was 0.7, we're, 0.8. Is we're walking our way back right. down to points. Wait, yeah. So I think before I do too much more hardcore coding and, and make code here, I do def definitely need to learn the data logging stuff. So I can really understand the values I'm working with. Okay, so it's 0.72. Okay, wait, you're not? Check, check. Okay, I don't know how that is too quiet. Yes! Wait. It may that... just start moving and then never stop because it never rechecks to be checks the sound level, right? But it should be checking it constantly. After every, it should check again after every single um, wave of the thing back and forth. Well, let's try introducing a stop. Oh wait, that should be what the weight is. Yeah. Unless, is there something weird with my logic here? Um, yeah, because it should say while 200 is less than the sound level. Let's try putting it on a button input and putting a stop at the end. And we can use it like a checker. Um, well, we could just say while... Um, I think we just do an input and then say while while button A is pressed. So this should tell us then if it will stop or if it just keeps going. All right, so it's not doing anything. Press button A. We just don't notice how loud this room is. <laughs> oh, I definitely notice how loud it is. 
that's a joke to our viewers because we have a huge loud AC system that we have to work against when shooting video. Yeah. Um, I hate to throw in the towel on this one until I understand how to do the logging a little bit better. Um, you can try 7.3. I feel like we almost got it there. Yeah, Juan Johnson also suggested the servo noise may be triggering once it... Oh, that's an interesting suggestion. So maybe if we move the servo further away, because you can see it is very close. Put this over here. All right. Still see both. All right, noise. Noise, noise, noise. I did it by like tapping. Nope. Hmm. Ignore my Chan suggested using an if then instead of a while. But maybe if we do another logic recheck on the sound level later. Yeah, I guess we could change the if to do that rather than a while loop. Or an if. Because then it would just, every time the sound level is above that, it would go, it would go through that twice. So let's pull this code out of here. Retain that block and this block and get rid of this while loop. We'll kind of clean up our workspace a little bit here. And I'll clean up the visual <clears throat> board visuals. Um, go into logic if this is true, then do this stuff. And change it to 74. It's ready to get code. <laughs> are they giving us a hard time? Some people I know in the chat are giving us a hard time. Oh. <laughs> Plant. All right, so it's not reacting yet. I don't like beating on the microphone like that. Okay, so that is getting close to what the interaction we want. We just can't figure out how to make the microphone work. <laughs> Without banging on it. User error. <laughs> Um, and here I thought we were loud. It's the only way to, short road to confusion is adjust two different variables at the same time. <laughs> but let's give it a go. So I feel like this is, this is a better code structure than we had with the while loop. Um, and... And part of the reason this is so fun for us is me and Tyler are really just getting a grasp on make code for the first time. Wait. Hello. Yay. We did it. Let's get, uh, put that on the full screen here. All right, so that is Kirby's automatic cheering machine. Now, quickly go patent it, Kirby, <laughs> and you've got yourself a little side business. Yeah, so then, uh, I don't know, you could use the, get, 
you ever go to eSports stuff and you get those, uh, I guess uh, I, they have them in regular sports too, the, the two inflatable tubes you bang together. The banging tube, Get yeah. those on two different servos and then as soon as, well, as soon as people start doing those, then it'll keep doing that forever <laughs> uh, because those things are so friggin' loud. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, so that's a quick look at the Circuit Playground. I love this board. Uh, I can't get enough of it. Um, now, that I, I, yesterday was my first time experimenting with Circuit Python, and I've been playing around with learning Python, uh, Python a little bit, uh, and I can't wait to go through the Adafruit tutorial uh, about Circuit, Play, Circuit Python to learn how to build stuff with it better. But this is a super fun board. Uh, don't take it lightly. Um, play around with it. Have fun with it. That's, yeah. the, real, that's the real key part of it. And just the, have fun with the it. The greatest thing is you can really get into it without having to solder or like find any components. You can just start iterating on whatever idea you have. Now, I mentioned that we're doing this new format so we can talk about building up skills with uh, the components that we're going to be working with that then go into actual projects. Uh, so the next, the project we're going to be building with the Circuit Playground next month is uh, a, 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 a project by our friend John, uh, John Park, and it is a DJ controller powered by the Circuit Playground. We have a little bit, a little demo of it right here. The paint has dried on the Circuit Playground, and now we're ready to fire it up. I'm gonna plug this in, and I've set up the MIDI controls to work with these surfaces, so let's give it a spin. That is the Adafruit Circuit Playground PZ1 Pizza Box DJ Controller. Now I got a delivery. See ya. All right, so if you followed along that video, that is this board, the Circuit Playground, uh, some conductive ink, a clever mask, a computer, and a pizza box. A pizza box DJ controller. Uh, I can't wait to build that thing and start playing around with it. Uh, I hope you'll join us next time for it um, uh, because that's going to be a lot of fun to play around with. Uh, in the meantime, I definitely want to thank DigiKey once again for being a part of this show and making it pos possible. They, uh, they're totally awesome. They distribute electronic parts. If you buy enough parts, they send you cool rulers. <laughs> um, they do custom branded boards like this Circuit Playground we've been playing around with today. And they're awesome partners. They make this show possible. and. So huge uh, thanks to them uh, for, for making this possible and letting us uh, build stuff with you guys. Um, and I and believe next uh, month we will have a cart so you can purchase the items to build the pizza box with us? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so uh, all the parts that you'll need uh, for that project um, that you can order from DigiKey, you can order straight from them. Uh, we'll have a shopping cart there, make it super easy to build. And we'll also have instructions on how to build that project. Uh, linked out so you can build it right along with us if you want to. Um, what else is coming up? Um, we have we have our, our new the new issue latest issue of Make Magazine. This is volume 62 um, and uh, this will be on newsstands very soon. If you're a subscriber you should be getting it uh, even sooner. Probably already. And this well I mean what, what was kind of the theme of this issue? The theme of this was emerging tech, um, and we kind of took a relook at cyberpunk, which was super popular in the 90s. Uh, some of us grew up as little young cyberpunks, and we wanted to see what cyberpunk looked like in the modern day with all of the electronics and cool things that we have yeah. access to. This is, this is my favorite two pair of pages in the magazine. Um, this was a dumb idea that, that the two of us <laughs> came up with that somehow managed to turn into reality. This is a very old page spread from a old magazine from the 90s called Monitor 2000 called Are You a Cyberpunk? And we loved it. It's dumb. It's hilarious. 
and we got the original author of that article to rewrite it for the modern era. And uh, we got to revisit it, and it's super fun. I can't, I can't believe this exists. Yeah, it was <laughs> so fun, and it was like kind of a dream come through, true to make this incredibly dorky, but also really, really cool photo project. Um, so that's going to be out on newsstand soon. It's going to be out to subscribers even sooner. So if you're one of those, be on the lookout for it. Um, if you are planning on showing stuff off at Bay Area Maker Fair, the call for makers is coming. Uh, the closing is closing pretty soon. I believe it already is closed, but we encourage you to get your early tickets if you did not sign up for the call for makers. Yeah. Uh, so we hopefully will see you then. We'll, of course, be seeing you live on this stream. Uh, many, many times before that happens, or at least a handful of times before that happens. So we look forward to seeing you there. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, coming up with your ideas of building projects like this cool, uh, you know, uh, stadium waiver. That's what <laughs> I'll call it. And um, thanks to DigiKey for making this possible. And thank, thank you, Hep, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Tyler, for having me. And we will see you guys next time on Make Live. And remember what I told you. Yeah, yeah, don't make eye contact. He takes it as a personal challenge. Hello? Pat? Yes? Can I get a, uh... He'll take a Raspberry Pi 3. <laughs> no pie for you! <laughs> told you. Hey, but I did hear this new deli. I can go pick up the sandwiches. No! Oh. Don't be held hostage by the board. Go to digikey.com to find thousands of boards in stock, all ready for immediate shipment.